Si vous vous intéressez un petit peu à l'évolution des logiciels Microsoft et de leur interface graphique depuis 20 ans, vous aurez pu remarquer une chose intrigante. Alors que Windows 3, sorti en 1990, apportait une interface graphique fonctionnelle, mais disons-le assez clairement pas très jolie, Windows 95 apporte au grand public le fruit de plusieurs années de recherche en interne et d'inspiration de ce que faisaient les voisins. Mais le résultat était là et la formule marchera bien. Tellement bien que Windows 98, que l'on voit ici, sera quasiment identique du point de vue de l'interface. Idem pour Windows 2001, qui changera quelques icônes, mais c'est tout. À croire que le design des systèmes de Microsoft s'était figé dans le temps, à la couleur et au pixel près. Les vrais changements du point de vue du design n'interviendront que dans Windows XP. Alors pourquoi en 2001 et pas avant La réponse se trouve peut-être en la personne de Surya Vanka que nous avons eu le plaisir de rencontrer il y a quelques mois. I came from a training initially in uh, uh, hardware products. I had a consulting office and one of my clients was Microsoft. And when I uh, was working at Microsoft, I really found it fascinating the kind of problems that were being solved at Microsoft. And so I made a shift really in my own career uh, from hard product to much more soft product. Surya Vanka est un designer et il rejoint Microsoft à la fin des années 90, au moment où la compagnie essaye de créer une version grand public de Windows 2000. Il arrive alors dans une société pleine d'ingénieurs et on peut être curieux de savoir comment la mise en place d'équipes dédiées à l'expérience utilisateur s'est effectuée dans ce contexte. The organizational structure of Microsoft is very, very non-hierarchical. So it's fairly flat. There's a lot of autonomy given to people. So it is not that somebody on top designs it and then everybody executes it. Innovation's happening at what you could call leaf nodes. Given that that is the culture of the company, it doesn't make any sense for us to have a centralized design team. So we tend to think about user experience as the larger construct. And within that, there are designers and researchers. There are about 400 development teams at Microsoft. And these folks are distributed among all those teams. My team's role is really to make sure that the goodness that is being created in one team, say in the office team, that provides value to the Windows team or to the hardware team or the Xbox team and so on. We also have a structure to make sure that teams aren't going off, you know, and designing completely in a different direction. While there's autonomy, we still are one company. En parlant de compagnie, justement, il y en a forcément une dont le nom est synonyme de design en informatique. Il s'agit bien évidemment d'Apple. Son système macOS a été et est toujours considéré comme un modèle, aussi bien en termes d'interface utilisateur qu'au niveau purement graphique. Son fondateur, Steve Jobs, bien connu pour son sens aigu du design, déclarera en 1994, en parlant des différentes versions de Windows, que finalement, le seul problème avec Microsoft, c'est qu'ils n'ont aucun goût. Steve Jobs Apple you know, been absolutely a f fabulous uh, uh, example of building extremely well-designed products. Uh, Steve Jobs has been a fa fabulous champion at being able to drive Apple in that direction. I think we are approaching it in a slightly different manner, right? Our approach has been a slower, steady approach. It's taken years to take this very large, capable, engineering culture with very, very deep technology roots and to slowly work it so that people really gain the appreciation of design. Part of how we are baking this uh, set of values in the culture is to really recognize from the top to the bottom and across all the different people that our next place where we go from being good to great is going to depend not only on being this great technology company, but is going to depend on being a great experience company. Prenons maintenant un exemple des avancées de Windows XP en termes d'expérience utilisateur. Une des lois de l'interface graphique s'appelle la loi de fit. Elle stipule que plus un objet est gros à l'écran, moins l'utilisateur mettra de temps pour le viser et cliquer. On peut remarquer que les boutons ont effectivement grossi dans Windows XP. Une autre règle concerne les bords de l'écran. Ceux-ci sont les endroits accessibles les plus facilement, car l'utilisateur n'a qu'à glisser la souris pour les atteindre et cliquer. Or, de Windows 95 à Windows 2000, les boutons de la barre des tâches se trouvaient à quelques pixels du bord, ce qui obligeait l'utilisateur à se recaler légèrement avant chaque clic. Avec Windows XP, la loi de fit est enfin respectée et ces boutons sont collés au bord de l'écran. Un soulagement après six années de torture, ce qui prouve que les règles élémentaires de design d'interface étaient enfin respectées. 
Cette loi est également à la base de quelques innovations d'Office 2007 et Windows Vista. I'm glad you brought up Fitch Law. It is something we talk about. And what's interesting is, this is not something that just designers talk about or user researchers talk about. Our people doing development know what Fitch Law is. And so these are the kinds of discussions that happen while product teams are building kind of products. So there are a few concepts, Fitch Law is one of them. But you know, there are a few dozen concepts which maybe have come from uh, psychology, have come from design. These honestly were not part of the vocabulary of engineering before. Even a word like desirable. This is not something you think really belongs in sort of uh, the vocabulary of engineering. But it's common, right? Fitch law is common. Talking about uh, customer love is common, right? Um, talking, uh, uh, engineers will talk about, we need to do a contextual inquiry. Right? Engineers will talk about, you know, how they need to do usability lab studies. So the vocabulary is changing very much. Un exemple, cette fois-ci des critiques qui reviennent régulièrement par les gens habitués à utiliser Windows, est la surabondance de textes explicatifs à l'écran. C'est particulièrement visible dans les dernières versions de Windows. On peut se demander si au final trop d'explications tue l'explication, et s'il ne faudrait pas plutôt préférer une interface plus dépouillée. My individual opinion on how much text there is is actually kind of irrelevant because it is really users what do they think do they think there's too much text or too little text the challenge of course for uh, folks like you and me who are tech savvy right is difficult for us sometimes to slip into the shoes of somebody who maybe is a novice user right and so which is why my opinion as an individual computer user is not very valuable at all The fact that I'm an expert user actually becomes a handicap, right? And you're an expert user too, right? And so our opinions after a point are not really valid. So I go back really to seeing what are the studies, right? And what did the studies tell us? And that is the right thing to do. Certains pourront se demander si, finalement, les études auprès des utilisateurs portent leurs fruits au vu du désamour de ces derniers pour Windows Vista. Cependant, cela ne devrait pas être le cas pour Windows 7, dont les premières bêtas publiques sont disponibles. Et le résultat est réellement probant, à tel point que beaucoup d'utilisateurs de XP attendent avec impatience la sortie officielle de Windows 7. Finalement, après 9 ans de recherche, de tests utilisateurs et de développement, qu'est-ce que signifie désormais le design pour Microsoft Je pense que le design pour Microsoft est... Vous pouvez penser à ça comme la prochaine vague, en quelque sorte, de Microsoft. Je vais commencer par dire, vous savez, I love design, right? I'm a designer, I love design. And for me, it's absolutely um, fascinating to watch the change uh, that's happened within Microsoft quite quickly. You know, I joined Microsoft about 10 years ago. And when I joined Microsoft, there were about 30 designers in Microsoft. Today, they're almost 900, right? So we're growing, we've been growing really, really fast. Early on and building a, a product Uh, technologies, you really have to do, make things that are useful for people. Then, uh, once we move further, you need to have things that are not just useful, but also very, very easily usable. And then as it spreads and becomes really mainstream, and you have a lot of different offerings, and you want to differentiate yourself, and you want to connect really with your customers, you start to really have to make things that are useful and usable, but also deeply desirable. We've had a very well-developed technical muscle at Microsoft for a long time. Now what we're doing is really building our design muscle to be as strong. And so the future is products that make that very deep emotional connection. So this is what design means. In terms of uh, who does this, I mentioned there are 900 people at Microsoft who are designers. It's just not those 900 people. Because design is a way of thinking, it's a set of values a way of connecting with the world, a sort of concern for human beings, a concern with some of the softer values. And we're taking this way of thinking and really training everybody at Microsoft, be they engineers, other people, but everybody. We do a lot of training to help people really uh, instill these other values of design so that we have technology and design.